welcome one and all to the Forensic Focus podcast. Uh, today, we have Mackenzie Jackson, who is from Geek Guardian. And I actually met his uh, counterpart, Dwayne, at the recent ICCWS conference over in the States um, and had a talk to them on their podcast. And we decided to bring the digital forensics focus uh, kind of for what their company does to our podcast. So uh, welcome, Mackenzie. Thanks for joining us today. Um, why don't you give us a quick overview of what Git Guardian is and kind of where you fit within the company? For, sh for sure. So Git Guardian uh, itself is a code security company. And what we really specifically focus on is detecting sensitive information inside source code. And when I'm referring to sensitive information, I, I'm typically talking about what we generally call secrets. And these are things like your API credentials. So your API tokens, they could be username and passwords. It could be your database passwords. And I mean, we can get into kind of why they exist a, a little bit later on, but that's essentially kind of the core of what Git Guardian uh, does. And we're expanding that into kind of broader areas now. We're expanding into infrastructure as code. And we also create uh, honeypots, which is kind of like tripwires for attackers. So you know when they're in the infrastructure. Um, but essentially at the core, what, what we started at and what we still mostly do is detect sensitive information. And and as far as uh, my role in Get Guardian, I actually came on to Get Guardian really early in their life. I was the... Um, when I joined the company, it was still just a, I think it was about 15 nerds in a, in an attic in Paris. <laughs> when we were, when we, when I first joined up, I was the first ever kind of marketing hire that they did. Although I'm a, an engineer by, by trade, I, I was kind of the first person that wasn't dedicated in that marketing, marketing space. Um, and so I joined as a d developer advocate or security advocate. Uh, which is a which is a, a strange role. It's a fun role. It's a basically just to try and create communities, answer questions, go on podcasts, um, and talk about the problem the problem in general. And that was uh, four years ago now when when I joined uh, the company, which is now about 125 people, uh, so quite big and and pretty global in in our reach. That really provides like a an interesting backdrop to how the company started. When you think of tech startups, you think of like a smelly garage in Silicon Valley. Whereas now I've got this <laughs> image of like this beautiful <laughs> attic in Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the background and you're just that's, going that's out us. and getting croissants before you're starting work. Uh, right? this, this is the romantic European take on tech startups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the American yeah. one, that's what it it's is. It's so much better. Yeah. Like, why doesn't everyone just move to France to do tech startups? <laughs> Well, you've never been to a French leaky attic. That's, <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, it's, okay. when, you, when you have to climb up, <laughs> you have to climb up eight flights of stairs every single day to get to this like small room. And a Paris is interesting because we don't have garages that we can um, uh, that we can we can start in. But if you think of French buildings, they're still, they're very old. And a lot of them are still designed in, in, in an old way in which our servants were meant to live in the house without ever being seen. So when you have places like the attics and kind of like small rooms that are tucked away, now they're kind of converted into these workspaces or these, or kind of small studio apartments. But that was once where the, the help used to live and they're right. weird because they're the buildings are designed in a way of which you can kind of get to your little area without having to interact with any of the people in the main <laughs> in the main residence <laughs> backstairs <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it's quite funny <laughs> so you mentioned your your background uh you were an engineer so maybe you can kind of explain to our listeners how you kind of got mm -hmm. into this role from maybe university through to, to where you are now, just as a bit of, I guess, the path into where you are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, it's, it's a bit of a weird, it's a bit of a weird kind of uh, story. But when I was, when I was like, in, uh, in high school, like I always absolutely loved programming. And I, uh, my, my side gig that I'd always kind of done throughout university and started in high school was to create websites for people i had a small niche where i would make websites for musicians because i kind of built up a template of what everyone wanted back in the early 2000s of 
their, you know, have a guest board and all of that. And basically just change a few of the images around and, and, and off we go. Was it my space? Uh, well, it was just my <laughs> Basically just for creating my space templates. I remember <laughs> that was the early days of cross-site scripting where you could just inject whatever you yep. wanted into your social media. <laughs> But um, I actually became uh, an architect, like a building architect during university. But I always maintained that I um, always maintained like that I, I, how I made money throughout the whole period was through software design. And I kind of became an architect because I guess my mom wanted me to. And like I, How I Met Your Mother was on and Ted was an architect. And I don't know why <laughs> I made that decision. Nice. But, yeah. <laughs> anyway... Uh, I got into I got into work. I got my engineering de degree, um, and I then just kind of went about trying to automate my job as best as I could. And so, in these kind of big software systems, you can actually write code in there. So, part of my job was what they call finding the highest and best use of land. And it was kind of like, hey, I get a block. This block. How many apartments could I fit in this block? How many car parks do I need? What are the regulations? So I kind of built some scripts that could do that. I never told anyone about it. I always just and I, and I just pretended. So, that so basically, you wrote Tetris for buildings, yeah? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever played <laughs> The Sims? It was similar, like <laughs> <laughs> but automatic. Um, and then I kind of decided, like, why the hell am I doing this? I, what I enjoy is coding, and I'm like mm. hiding that fact of of my job. Um, which I, I now reflect on being stupid. I'm sure my work would have loved it had I told them that I'd built this thing that they could use. But, mm. um, you know, and then I ended up in a startup. We founded my own company. It was called Compago, still exists today. It's based in uh, Brisbane, uh, headquartered in Brisbane. I'm not really a part of it anymore, but uh, it, it was, I was there for, you know, five years. And then eventually kind of I exited from that organization. I admit my girlfriend and I was like, hey, wherever you want to go in the world, let's do it. Let's have an adventure. She chose Paris. That's how I ended up in Paris. And then I got to Paris and I realized that, that I really needed something to fill my time. And then I, I went on to, uh, uh, I went on to, and I had no idea what to do because I, I was the CTO of this startup. I don't have, I have an engineering degree, but I don't really have like a good bones of software engineering. Most of the early days of my startup was copy and pasting from Stack Overflow. But I had lots of weird skills. So I had no idea what to do. But I got into Paris and there's just like a, a job search called Welcome to the Jungle in, in France. And I just typed in the native English speaker to see what came up. And then this job came up, which was like, I need to be a good public speaker. I need to understand code, but I'm not really going to be coding a lot. And kind of just the area. And I was like, hey, this is me. This is. And then I got super deep into the world of security. And I've been here ever since. That's a very long explanation. I apologize. Oh, that's a fantastic <laughs> yeah. explanation. The, the the first web designer I ever worked with was an architect as well. He he dropped out to uh, to pursue it because it was a way more lucrative and satisfying way to spend I, his life. So, uh, architecture was is one of those things where it kind of sounds it sounds nice, but once you're in there and you realize that most of your job is designing bathroom and stair details, and that <laughs> you, and, you know like. <laughs> And working with building regulations, it's like it quickly loses its appeal. And it's not mm. like being a lawyer where you can hate your job and just kind of generally do shitty things, but still get paid enough to kind of sleep at yeah. night comfortably in a big ass bed. And an architect, you're in one of those Parisian basements made for the maid. <laughs> So, yeah <laughs> yeah down with the damp instead of up with the damp yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool so i i i I've been in security for for a long time, and um, you know, hard coded credentials in code is uh, is and has been a problem forever. I mean, it's a it's a it's a thing. But I mean, where I'm I'm getting old now. So when I started out, it was all usernames and passwords, hard hard coded in scripts. Uh, I was a Unix mm -hmm. admin, so you go through and find them embedded in scripts everywhere. Yeah, I may have left a few lying around myself because there's no other way of doing this, or not a convenient way of doing it. Um, but now we're into vastly different world where there's there's other stuff out there. What, what sort of things are you uh, are you looking for now, um, as opposed to mm -hmm. just sort of you know usernames and passwords? For for sure. Well, I mean, um, so much so much wacky stuff. And and as you're talking, and what you kind of alluded there is how how much the attack surface has kind of expanded in the form of code. Because yes, we still have our source code, 
But now we've also got things like GitOps or infrastructure as code, and we're codifying so many elements of kind of what what we would we would have done manually or had different roles and now this is all kind of ending up inside our git repositories so the scope is much worse so we still have username and passwords that are hard coded in there solar winds which was uh which is which is a company that had a massive supply chain attack which affected massive players like the u.s military and you know about as deep as you can go you know they they uh, just before that attack, someone from SolarWinds hard coded a username and password for an FTP update server. So like that's pretty old school, um, and the password was SolarWinds one two three, and the <laughs> email was something like you know admin at SolarWinds. So, like you, and this was in a public Git repository. So that still happens, but mostly what we're talking about is it would be like you know your API keys. These are the biggest one. Your cloud infrastructure keys. So around about 20% of the keys that we find um, are for cloud infrastructure, around about 27% are for databases. Uh, so, so lots of this kind of, kind of things. And to, to understand how they get in there, because I'm sure some people, because whenever you have this conversation, there's nobody like, yes, but oh my God, you have to be an idiot to hard code your credentials and put it inside a Git repository, let alone a public Git repository. But the, the problem is actually kind of a lot deeper than that, because when you think about, you know, Git, it's version controlled, which means that you have a version of everything. So let's say that I give a developer a task and say, hey, I want you to connect up with Algolia and build a search functionality that's going to sift through this data. And then, so the first thing that I do is I create some obscure branch that I'm going to work off for this feature. I hard code the credentials in just to start with because I want to get something quickly happening, right? This proof of concept. I just want to get something on the page that's like, yes, I could interact with this data set via this API. I get that happening. I make it all look pretty. A hundred commits later, I remove those hard coded credentials because I know that that's not what I want in the end. I use environment variables. I send it off to a code review. Code reviewer checks it. Yep, all good. I can't see any credentials. Everything looks right. It gets merged into master unknowingly that that history persists so now you have these credentials buried in hundreds of commits on some weird branch that that no one's going to be able to discover unless you're really looking for credentials in your git repository and then let's talk about six months later when that repository is now made public you have just made all that history public along with it um, and even squashing history doesn't necessarily get rid of everything, you know, because that's the other argument that people hear. So we find lots of weird stuff, and a lot of it isn't on that top level, right? Because if we look at a different type of vulnerability, cross-site scripting, for example, you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your application, you change it, you, you manage, you handle your data differently, so you no longer have that vulnerability, and now your app is secure. But with credentials, it's not the case because even when you get rid of them, they still exist in your code and that's the risk in and of itself. So we find lots of weird stuff in repositories and a lot of it's buried. And just to give you an example of how much we find, we uh, most of what we do from our company is what we get paid for is we protect private infrastructure. But what we also do is we detect secrets in public places. So one of the most obvious places we look for credentials is, is github.com of all public repositories. So we actually scanned every single commit that was made to github.com last year. That's over a billion commits. So a commit is kind of like, you know, a contribution is pushing code, uploading code, maybe you would to, to GitHub. So that happened a billion times last year and GitGuardian scanned every single one of those commits for secrets. And we found 10 million secrets just last year. And as I said, 20% of them were for cloud provider keys. And, and we actually checked the validity of these keys. So it's not like we find a key and we think it's real. We actually check it with the provider. Hey, is this real? And they come back saying yes. So over a million cloud provider keys that were valid were leaked last year. And, and we could go on about all the different types. But yeah, so we find lots and lots of different stuff and lots of different areas in lots of weird places, basically. So going just just, just on, on the basis of that, you, uh, I've got so many questions from that alone. <laughs> I mean, like, how huge is your infrastructure to do this? Because that sounds like a hell of a task. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's helped a little bit by how our by how GitHub is set up and how Git is set up. So, um, yeah, we it is a hell of a task. We have massive infrastructure to be able to do that, but it is surprising that it's it's how easy it is. So, for example, if you're listening at home and you're in front of your computer, you can go to the the URL uh, api.github.com forward slash events. This is a public API. You don't need authentication to look at it. You can call it, I think, 60 times uh, in an hour without any authentication. That's the public infrastructure of GitHub. Everything that happens publicly on GitHub is published on that page, that events ledger, if you will. So there we are. We can connect up to that really easily to just start sifting through information. Um, and we're not the only ones that do it. I, we've done lots of experience where we leak you know, a honeypot credential. This is kind of like a fake credential that that's kind of real, but doesn't pose any risk and allows us to monitor an attacker. It will take less than a minute before someone starts to try and exploit that credential if you leak it on GitHub publicly. And that's because it's so easy to monitor. Now, when you're talking about monitoring all of it, okay, then it's a big job. And we also have, uh, yeah, yeah, we've, We've worked a lot at making sure that our scanning is very lean, but also very effective and lots of different areas. But as like, if you want to get started, so I said we found 10 million credentials. Okay, let's say you're an attacker. You don't want to find 10 million. You want to find 20. Like you just need to monitor that, not even consistently, just monitor it as much as you can for like a week and you'll you'll have more than you would ever know what to do with. So. So yes, it's, it's big, but you know, you can also scale it down to a much more manageable side if you, if you want to. Oh, that's incredible. So um, I, I, I just wanted to ask back, you were talking about, so I've done some GitHub forensics with like version history stuff in CTFs mm -hmm. only. Um, but you said something there about squishing history. What, like, what is that? And is that meant to be like a mitigation towards removing some of the history and, and what do you mean when you said that it's not always that effective? Oh, get like so get merge squash or something like that is basically saying that hey, we're, we're merging some branches and I kind of just want to make it more manageable. So I want to squish down all the versions. So like instead of having a hundred different versions, we, we're we're reducing this so that on our Git tree it looks more manageable. Mm -hmm. It's basically just a cosmetic thing. So. Uh, what a lot of people kind of do is they squash their history thinking that that then removes everything that right. um, and 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 therefore like so that if there were secrets in in that in that deep in that tree in that history that now that I've squashed them it gets rid of them but but you just got to understand that git is much more git is very complicated and a lot of the things that it aims to do is to be reversible in a lot of things mm. because what why we have history is because if we break something we can move back mm -hmm. so um so basically squashing your history is a cosmetic thing is what i try and to get across and you do lose some data and and you know and it certainly can make it harder to find these things but squashing your history isn't going to solve the problem um, so, so, but it makes it, you know, like, but it, it, it just kind of adds another level of obfuscation to it. Mm -hmm. makes it a bit more confusing. But I mean, like when you're using automated tools like none of this stuff matters, right? The tools are going to, the tools are going to be able to recreate and put back together, whatever you, whatever you had. Um, mm -hmm. and all that metadata of everything that you've done, you know, will persist in, in, and that, and it persists for a reason. And that's basically so that these things are reversible uh, when you go through. Right. Um, I mean, Git. Git is. I'm not going to say it's. It's relatively new in the terms of VCS systems, although relatively new now is 20 years old. Um, <laughs> I mean, I remember. I remember it coming onto the Dorse scene. Forge. Um, yes. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do you guys? Do you guys work with with some of the other? Well, not that there are that many left, but do you work with some of the other? Um, VCS systems online, or or are you? I mean, so we, you're, we it's in the company with... name, but yeah. I mean, we work with any Git system. So like Bitbucket, GitLab, um, uh, you know, like, you know, obviously GitHub, uh, Azure repos. We work with all the Git. We natively integrate with that. What, what we also have is that, I mean, it's not just, it's not just in Git that you find secrets. This is kind of like the, your, your version control is, is kind of for what, where the sources come from. So in terms of 
other people there are some other we have we have had some inquiries where people were using different areas and yes we do we can scan them but we have to do it through an api and through some other manual uh kind of inceptions so you, when you put up if you put up hooks into where where your code's being pushed onto this whatever repository or server that it's hosted on we can scan it through an api but in terms of kind of like native integration where we fit really seamlessly into it and we have you know all the bells and whistles that's get and that's like 95 percent of organizations and outside of that i mean the the biggest laggers and techs are like banks because they're still using like cobol and old school languages and like they're the most resistant to changing infrastructure ever and we're dealing with large banks that are fully integrated into git now so when you so if you're if you're not using kind of git and you're stuck to something on the the later end of version control i mean you you have to be pretty far down the the laggard curve yeah. um to be doing that but a, but a, but a different way of, of of answering that is to kind of say there there are secrets in lots of other places so they can end up inside backups inside mm. your wikis inside your slack messaging systems you know they can end up you know in email they can end up on your networks lots of different places outside of version control and we do scan all those except we do that through uh, we have like uh, cli tools one's called gg shield where you can scan directories or, or do anything else it does it all through you know apis it's not quite as elegant because it needs to be a bit more it needs to be a bit more manipulatable because your yeah. your system's going to be different Mm. Um, but we can do it and we do do it. And we find lots of weird stuff everywhere, but if you talk it, but the, the reason why we focus on Git is because generally speaking, that's the central source of what we call like, uh, secret sprawl is because when something hits Git, you know, it's cloned onto everyone's machine. It's probably backed up. It's probably pulled across into some wiki. It's, you know, like it ends up in your, your running application. It's connected to your CI CDs. It's how you manage your infrastructure. So when you talk about we, when we want to try and isolate secrets from leaking, like Git is the, the place to be and then build out from that mm. or whatever version control, you know, if you're not using Git, then, um, then I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're, you're, you're pretty old school, but I mean, we, we can still help. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> cool. And um, one of the things you said was, um, that you verify the code, the keys that you find, how have, I mean, I'm, I'm, we can delete this in a minute if this turns out to be something you don't want to incriminate yourself with. Um, but, you know, I'm assuming you're not just trying these on the web and seeing whether they let you in or not. You said you you contact the cloud service providers. How have you built that relationship? Because, I mean, a lot of the cloud service providers are, I mean, huge and frankly don't give a toss, as far as I can tell. I mean, you know, trying to get anything out of Microsoft uh, from a forensic perspective when you go and say, hi, can I please have a copy of this Azure? They come back and say, go, give me a warrant. And, you know, that it sort of falls flat. Um, you know, how have you guys found integrating into, you know, these these uh, these large cloud providers? Well, so we don't actually have relationships with the cloud providers, um, like for, for, for the for the most part, uh, at least. So what what we do is there's, there's two kind of areas. Um, the first one is that when we're when we're integrated with a customer. So they say that, you know, you're you're my you're I don't know, a company, a startup you're using our, our tool. And so basically when you sign up, and this is in the, the when, we're, when we're kind of scanning your private infrastructure, like your private Git repositories, then you know, you're the owner of these keys and you're allowing us to check them, basically. So you're allowing us to kind of make a non-intrusive API call. So kind of saying on the web, just basically test if this works. That's essentially what we're doing. We're just making a call and seeing what we get back. And we do it in, in basically that the, the just testing of the keys valid, the least intrusive API call that you can make. Now, if we shift this into the public sphere, I thought I said that we scan public infrastructure um, of something that's that's leaked, like publicly on GitHub.com, for example. And we test those as well. And so here things get a little bit tricky, but essentially something is in the public domain, and when you have uh, when you have public interest, when you're doing something non-intrusive with the public interest, then then that is deemed as being kind of a responsible disclosure of 
you know, w w sponsor of disclosure of vulnerabilities. And we're investigating this with the purpose of notifying the provider or the user that this key has been leaked. So like it, it's, it's kind of like calling a number that you find in a lost wallet. You know, like it's not, it's not a spam call because we're not doing it for any marketing purposes. We're just trying to find out if this key is valid. So, I mean, it is like, it is a little, uh, I mean, like it, it, it's a little bit alarming for someone to, when we tell them that their keys are valid, but at the end of the day, this is the best way for us to be able to kind of reduce false positives and keep the community safe, um, at, at, as safe as possible as we can. And we detect, you know, we have over uh, 350 specific detectors that we look for. So trying to manage a relationship with 350 different providers would just would be pretty unattainable for a company mm -hmm. of our size. So it's really the only way that we can that we can do it is just to basically test to see if they work. And sure. if it's private, then we have permission to do that. And if it's public, and if it's public, then it's public. You know, so 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 you know, like we have to try and use what we can because the attackers are going to be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I guess pivoting into the kind of the attacker thing, um, you mentioned before solar winds and um, the FTP server credentials um, being published. Mm -hmm. What kind of other, I guess, out there published breaches kind of come to mind that fits this kind of um, leak? that it's been part of the initial access or um, source code's yeah. been leaked just so that we can link these in the show notes and, and people can go read about them as well. For sure. I mean, there's so many, there's so many cases to talk about and there's different, uh, different categories. So maybe what I'll do is we'll talk about stuff that's leaked publicly and then we can talk about stuff that's leaked privately that's also been used by attackers. But to start mm -hmm. off with just the public ones, like if we look at just what's happened like recently, uh, last year, Toyota, um, had, they have a product called T-Connect. It's a mobile application that essentially uh, acts as a key for your car. And uh, in a public repository that wasn't owned by Toyota, was actually owned by a consultant that was working with Toyota. Uh, the access keys to, to the, to the ad, admin keys to databases of this application were published in a public repository which essentially would enable attackers to access all the information of anyone that's using that, that application and give them a foothold into the internal infrastructure uh, of, of basically essentially an app that can start your car uh, and do lots of other, other things as well. So that's kind of one thing that's kind of happened publicly. One very recently, which happened not last week, but the week before, uh, if we're looking at what type of companies actually leak public credentials, so someone from GitHub leaked GitHub's root SSH key publicly on their <laughs> repository. So what this would enable an attacker to do is set up a man in the middle attack and basically listen and obtain information that's going through private, you know, going to your private repositories on GitHub. So this is something that GitHub did themselves. Now it was caught very quickly. So I don't, you know, but there's still you still have to change you still have to change keys if you're using SSH and there's still lots of things to to kind of go through. So th every, like, this happens to lots of different companies. Uber's had a number of times where they've leaked their uh, S3 buckets and bad actors have accessed them. So there's lots of different things that or that kind of happen on the public sphere. Now, if we talk about the private sphere, because what people kind of say is that look, we have no public code repositories. We don't deal with any open source. I mean, none of our employees push anything publicly. I mean, you could never say that, but you know, let's just say that everything you do is behind authentication. You have multi-factor authentication and you have your code is like your vault, but your code is incredibly leaky. And so what we often find is, you know, for example, Twitch had all of their source code leaked because of a misconfiguration. Basically, someone set remote access to true instead of false in some infrastructure as code, and Twitch's source code was all publicly available. Uh, we we found this code, we scanned it, and we found 6,000 credentials, including 194 AWS credentials inside Twitch's source code that now is everywhere on the internet that you want to look. And so what attackers often do is they really target source code. So... Uh, last year, we saw lots of source code leaks with uh, uh, mostly by a group called Lapsus, uh, which was, a, I think, a UK-based 
hacking organization. They ended up being a lot of teenagers. And they leaked source code for NVIDIA, Microsoft, Samsung. Um, they got into Ubisoft gaming, lots of different stuff that these attackers did. And everyone's kind of wondering, how did these group of teenagers actually access the private source code of all these great companies which have good security posture? And the answer came through their Telegram channel when they were literally just paying people to give them access to source code repositories. Others paying employees, like, hey, you work for Microsoft, you had a bad week, we'll give you five grand if you give us access to the internal code repository. Once in there, then you've got access to all the secrets and you can move laterally and you can elevate privileges and whatever you, it may be that you're targeting, you can do a lot from that source code. And it's a very low barrier to entry. And it's, you know, source code is meant to be shared and sprawled by everyone. That's the whole idea of Git. So it makes it very hard to be able to stop and prevent that. So that's kind of looking at the, the, the private source code. And one good example um, that does involve someone from the Lapsus group uh, is that Uber had a massive kind of worst case scenario breach where uh, a credential to their VPN was, was published on the dark web. It was bought, so it was purchased by someone from Lapsus. They had multi-factor authentication. And basically through social engineering, they called up this guy and said, hey, we're from the security team. You need to give us access to to the network uh, through your account. The guy clicked yes on the multi-factor authentication app and then Lapsus had access to the network. Once they were on the network, they found uh, admin credentials to the PAM system, the privileged access manager system. So basically what this means is they had admin credentials to both the secrets manager and the password manager. And they were able to access every single uh, system that Uber used, like from their cyber defense to their Git repositories, to their cloud infrastructure, to their Slack channels. They had the keys to the kingdom, the complete master keys to the kingdom because someone had put this in a PowerShell script on the network. Um, so, that, so that's kind of like secrets being internal. And so attackers often use this. And when we look at, when we break apart attacks, what you'll find is that secrets are always, generally always used at some point. Now it may be the initial access. So with SolarWinds, we may be able to elaborate that that FTP server is how they got initial access and then did more stuff. But they also might not be. It might be that they had access to a server and now they've found secrets to move into different systems. So credentials are used in lots of different areas. So that's just a, a kind of a, a few of the the kind of attack scenarios. And there's lots more. And I, I'll send you links for, for what we've just talked about uh, for the show notes. Is... <clears throat> Is there, a, where, where is the problem here? Is it the design of Git that just replicates stuff ad, ad hoc? Well, not ad hoc. Well, it is ad hoc, to be fair. Um, <laughs> or is it that we just have such poor coding standards that do this? Or is, is, there, is there a sort of a middle ground whereby Git is replicating things it shouldn't be necessarily, and there's not enough... It should, there should be a deny all and a specific allow versus a, let's just copy everything to a server. Is it is it an engineering problem here that, that we have or is it a, a human problem or is it just everything? I, well, I think mostly it's, it's kind of a human problem, but, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with Git. And, I, and, and it's kind of like saying that, you know, like, it, there's, no, there's nothing, there's also nothing wrong with like open source or, for, or any of the technologies that we use. It's definitely how we use them. So there's a lack of understanding of how, how these systems work, though, um, because a lot of people kind of don't factor in the history or think that because it's they have to authenticate into GitHub that that's acceptable to have secrets in there. So there's a bit of a human element uh, here as well. Uh, but I think the real problem actually comes from, I, I guess, kind of the reliance that we've built up on these APIs. So... For example, um, you know, like there's some some things that we can do to help this solve them, which which is kind of ig ignoring the fact that secrets are going to keep getting leaked on Git, is we can really lock down our APIs. So if w this API is designed to be accessed by this other service, well, then the only person that can use that API is this service. We have their IP address range, or we have different validations that we can use that really locks down this this API. Other things that we can do is we can automatically rotate our credentials every two months or, or whatever it may be so that when stuff gets leaked, 
that they automatically becomes valid invalid um, and there's a kind of other other areas that we can do around zero trust which is kind of like saying just because an api key gets leaked doesn't mean that someone that shouldn't use it can use it i feel like that's kind of, that's part of the problem as well, the fact that we kind of create these API keys that just anyone can use that have no rotation policies to them. There's some companies that are helping to try to solve this. So HashiCorp, uh, they create a product called HashiCorp Vault. It's a secrets manager. There's other managers out there that can do this as well. I just use HashiCorp because they created this concept. They created a concept called Dynamic Secrets, which is basically a one-time use secret, whereas a secret is generated to access something just in time you know just to, just for that one kind of use and then it's destroyed so that means that these secrets aren't kind of floating around and if they are then they, they've been used so they're not used anymore and it forces good practices so i'm really hesitant to blame git i'm also really hesitant to blame developers because i think that uh like mistakes happen it's often all never malicious and it comes from a misunderstanding of how everything works and i don't know how detailed we expect everyone to understand all their systems that that work but if you really want to solve the problem then we need to implement further restrictions on our apis we need to scan our infrastructure so that we know when they're leaked and then we also need to give developers tools so that they can prevent them from leaking so you know it's something really simple that helps this problem that's super simple to do is to set up a git hook that detects secrets when you commit code and it will just block the commit if it contains secrets. It will let you know and say, hey, there's a secret in here. You've got to remove this before we let you commit it into the repository. And then that that's kind of stops the bleeding a lot. So you can so the, the, there's lots of things that you can do. And I really don't know, like, there's no one thing I can point to and say, that's it. That's where the problem is. And if we can solve that, it's just kind of how we build stuff that's made it difficult. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. And it, and it sounds kind of like where the cybersecurity industry is at the moment with users is it's just that basic security hygiene and monitoring mm. and logging on top of it to say, like you said, with the GitHawks, like, hey, you've got credentials here. We're not going to commit it because we're auditing what, you, what you're pushing into the commit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't need, yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things. And, and it's often with security, right? It's boring. It's boring yeah. to talk about password <laughs> hygiene, right? You know, yeah. like, oh, God, we're still talking about that. But like, I mean, that's kind of like kind of really comes down to really what it is. Everyone had good hygiene and there's lots of tools that, and, that we can use to help that and enforce that. And I think that's kind of part of solving the problem. Um, but at the moment, the problem's getting worse. We find more and more secrets leaked every year. And so uh, it's, it's challenging to kind of to, to wonder where, where we're going to be in this in this issue. In in, in that regard, is what well, you're seeing more and more secrets leaked every year. There are obviously more and more users using GitHub. Is it the same percentage of secrets just over a larger number of users, or is it a larger number, a larger percentage over a larger number of users? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's 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 two factors each each year that do help contribute to it so last year uh the report that we published had six million credentials the year before that had three million this year we have 10 million so between this year and last year there's about a 67 percent increase in, in that github increased their users by about 20 percent, so that accounts for some of it and also we get better every year at detecting secrets so we can we can say that part of the reason why that increases also because with it you know we've spent a whole year expanding our detection service we're getting better so so that but that doesn't account for the complete amount so it's really hard to pinpoint um, you know exactly how much one area is that uh, if you look at how many secrets we detect per commit so per one thousand commits we detect, I forget the number, I think it's four secrets. You know, four secrets every thousand commits that goes to GitHub, we detect a secret. What I do know is that was a 50% increase from the year before. So from the same amount of code, we've increased 50%. Let's say that we've improved 20%. It still leaves a lot of kind of increase. And what this can be explained for is that now we're using source code for, for lots of different areas that's more sensitive. 
like infrastructure as a code, you know, where we're integrating all of our pipelines and everything into our repositories with GitHub Actions and other areas. Uh, and we're also kind of using a lot more artificial tools to help us code quickly, but those help us almost skip past the lessons where we would have learned that hard coding credentials was bad because we're kind of moving faster. So I mean, all of these things consider like, so yes, the increase of code is part of it. Yes, us getting better is part of it. But I mean, lots of it's just, it's just getting worse. It's really interesting that you brought up the automated tools that help us do this because we were <laughs> having a, a very brief chat at yeah, the beginning we of this before you came on about Copilot. Mm -hmm. and um, its role in GitHub now. Do you think that's having an impact on it? I, in the, I can now, I, I'm going to say, I, I'm not a developer. I don't do, I don't do much coding. And what coding I do is poor and probably has embedded credentials, but I don't use Git, so minor mm. detail. Um, but I understand that, you know, you start and it auto-completes for you. So, you know, is this a, a an issue of... Um, you know, people trying, I, I need a password, I, I need to authenticate, and it's bringing this in, or, uh, and, and also, um, my understanding of, um, of Copilot is that, um, it's scrape, it itself is scraping Git for the source, um, the, the, the training sets. So one would mm -hmm. assume that actually it is in itself ingesting all of these credentials that are lurking in the background. So it is. So, so there's, I mean, there's a couple of things about about Copilot, and I wrote I wrote a blog um, the, about this called "Shitty Code, Shitty Copilot." Um, but uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, there's there's a few things. So when Copilot first came out, one of the ways that you could find a credential was by prompting it to, to go, you know, AWS underscore key equals, and then it would kind of give you a key. And and a lot of those were valid. Some of them weren't, but like were old keys. And basically, it was finding it from its code base. Like yes, these finding these keys. That kind of quickly stopped happening. So now that 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 wouldn't really. I mean apart from like a really edged case, but there's, that doesn't really happen, happen now. The problem with things like Copilot is that it's being trained on massive, and all AI tools, right, are being trained on massive data sets. Most, like take, take 10 open source repositories, there's random open source repositories, none of them are going to be absolute trash. None of them is someone started project that they never finished some portfolio thing that they did for a work interview or, or something, you know, like that, that, that isn't fully formed like a lot of that. And that's what GitHub Copilot is being trained on like 90% trash code. So it's, it has its place and, and, you know, like uh, AI writers, you know, like you can, most of what's written on the internet isn't great. And that's what it's being trained on, but you can use it as a starting point. I've got no problem with using them as a starting point. And AI is interesting because, I mean, it depends on, on how it evolves and where it goes. But it, it but this is kind of like a, it, it could be a great tool for being like, okay, you're hard coding a credential and immediately your AI tool stops you and goes, hey, this is a terrible idea. Why don't we do this instead? And then gives you how to use an environment variable and create a .env file, all of which is easy. So it could, it could be, it, it doesn't do this. I want to be clear, it doesn't do this at the moment. But when you look at this, we're in the infancy of it. It could be a good strategy that basically prevents people from doing poor coding practices. But that's going to rely on it being trained on good quality code. And if we look at just kind of the code that's out there, well, most of it isn't good quality. And so like when I go back to my blog post, Shitty Code, Shitty Copilot, it was basically that if you wanted to have good quality code, then you needed to write your code like in the best hygiene possible start off with your author comment everything really well and then it would actually give you good outputs because it's referencing other code that starts like that which is good quality code and if you're a junior developer that's just trying to code something quickly then it's going to take examples from other people so basically if, you, if you're a shitty coder you're going to have a shitty copilot if you're a good copilot good coder you're going to have a good copilot so we need to try and be able to distinguish what is good code what is bad code and only train our models on good code. I mean, that's a, that's a challenge, but it could be a good thing, right? It could be, yeah, it could be a good yeah. thing. So I get, I get two things out of that. And 
first one is I want to apologize to all the junior directors because 90% of that code, I'm I'm in there with my GitHub for sure. Um, <laughs> Me too, buddy. Me yeah. too. We've already established that I'm a shitty coder. Yeah. <laughs> um, number number two is that it it sounds it sounds like from the media that some of the stuff is looking like it wants to go that way where it's providing suggestions with, hey, that's a shitty idea and it just reminds me of we're finally going to get Clippy back but in like a more modern version where he's tapping on your screen to yeah. go, don't be an idiot. Yeah, um, yep, basically. Yeah, that that's really cool. Um, so I want to flip here to the kind of security side with um, investigators. So we kind of, anyone that's had to investigate something always comes across like a new platform or something that they need to dig into. So looking at uh, Git repositories seems like such a niche skill to me because it's not something that I come across every day. Like obviously there's companies like yours that are built to do mm -hmm. forensics around this. Um, what would you suggest to someone who is an investigator that comes across a case that they have to like go to a, a public GitHub and, and maybe the, their client has said, like they've had a breach and their client has said, hey, we've got this, this GitHub. We need you to go look if our credentials were leaked there and, and do initial access, like for that one case, what what's kind of your suggestion for them to get a crash course on it or like where to start, I guess, N noting that there's like that squashing history that you were talking about and there's a whole bunch of version yeah. control. I, I mean, look, the, the only way to kind of understand Git repositories is to use the tools that ingest that information because uh, it's like 10% of, of a Git repository, unless it's kind of, on its first commits is going to be behind the scenes and it's going to be a real pain to kind of go through any of that manually so there's lots of tools out there so i'm from a vendor git guardian yet we have some tools and some free tools but there's also lots of open source tools in there and i think one of the differences is that if you're investigating something like something that open source tools generates a lot of is false positives but if you're investigating something and you're taking your time to understand it, then I, I feel like, you know, like that's an investigation, false positives are okay. Um, but in real life, when you kind of got time on your hands and not. So there's free tools out there, Git leaks, Truffle hogs are a bunch of them where you can scan your repositories and pull out information. You know, if you're looking for security vulnerabilities, then it's going to be the same thing. Yeah, infrastructure is code scanners to try and look at you know what 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 has been leaked and are there any business logic flaws that have been exposed in this code i mean that's what i'd be looking at so if you're looking at a git repository and you're kind of you're not you're, you you know what a git repository is right but you're doing forensics and 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 you're not intimately familiar with the with the technology it's it's now it's time to get some tools to help you sift through this information because it's much deeper than you would expect it's much more complicated than you would expect i mean this was built originally by um leonard uh oh i forget his name leonard, the guy that created linux any everything he does is, is linus very torvald. complicated linus torvald that's it yeah i was I don't know why i was thinking leonard linus linus torvald so everything that you know like that's great that's just it's very complex um with great roots but gets the same you know it's a complicated system so you need to kind of go through and and use that so if you're doing forensics hey there's lots of automated tools out there that are going to help you. It's time to take a look at them and don't try and sift through this information yourself because you're going to miss it. Um, and then the other things is make sure you look at things like you're looking at your Git commit messages. There's going to be lots of, we find lots of sensitive information in messages themselves. You know, look at, uh, at different areas of Git, like issues that have been raised because they will give you clues as to kind of what's happened. So, yeah, you, you're going to have to dive a little bit deeper into the hood, but it's okay because you don't have to do it manually. In the in the inverse of that, in 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 protecting my own terrible code from either being scraped or from from containing secrets, is a private repository actually sufficient protection for me to include hard coded credentials, or or do we just say no, this is bad? No, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, good answer. I'm happy with that. So a private, a, a private, a private repository is not the solution. No, no it's absolutely, not a absolutely solution. Not. And, and I and I and I get kind of where you're coming at too. Is you're saying, hey, I don't work with a team. 
right? It's no, no one from my team can be turned. I'm not a big company, so attackers aren't after me. So why can't I put my personal stuff in a private, uh, in a private repository? And it basically, is there's lots of ways for your credentials and everything to get to get leaked. And what we're finding is in our latest report, the State of Secrets Pool, we tracked credentials from being leaked on GitHub and then being exposed in dark web forums and being sold. So your credentials could be leaked in a number of different ways and be sold on a forum, which may give someone access to a private repository. And all of this is just kind of automated. So it's just very, very weak authentication to have credentials credentials inside your, your private Git repository. And there's no logging. So you don't, so if someone gets access to it, you have no idea if they've been, they've been in there. You have no idea on what machines it's been into. Do you have backups automatically done? Is your code now in your Dropbox because you're automatically backing up your Apple Drive or, or your computer? Is it in, is it in Apple Drive? You know, like where you, you don't, I can guarantee you that even if it's just you using a private Git repository, your code is in way more places than you would ever expect. And if your Dropbox credentials get sold on a dark web forum, then you know someone has access to your code, or whatever it may be, right? There's just lots of different ways that it could happen. What you can do, there is a solution that doesn't involve too much kind of heavy tooling. I would cr not recommend this for anyone working in groups bigger than like five people. And a lot of security people will, will turn arc at me for saying this but what you can do is there's products out there called get secret and essentially what it does is it encrypts your secrets so let's say you're storing your secrets in an environment variable file a env file and you want a way to be able to share that or store it in git because it's convenient for you you can encrypt that file and put it into your git repository encrypted this gives you a single point of failure it's not particularly great for a security point of view but if the difference is between but it's easy so if the difference is, hey, we're going to encrypt them or not encrypt them, then let's just, let's just start by going to encrypt them. It's it's easy. It's quick. You can de-encrypt it with your command line. Like it's just it's just a very low barrier to entry. Don't hard code secrets ever, because if you're hard coding them just for personal projects, then that's just going to translate into your work. So it's just just practice mm -hmm. good hygiene. Um, but you can store them in Git. Just make sure they're encrypted, and just yeah, just. Just don't, <laughs> don't hard code credentials and put it in Git. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, awesome, mate. I think so. We're coming to the top of the hour. It's been super informative um, talking about GitHub and the forensics and and kind of what you guys do as well. Um, and I'm sure the listeners will get heaps out of it. Yeah. I'll throw one last question to you to to wrap it up. But what do you do to unwind? Like, what's your downtime? Oh, oh, what's my dance? Okay. Uh, well, I, I get to travel a lot for work and I'm a total history geek. So I, I've been, I, I've, I, I travel to like uh, historic places and castles. I'm from New Zealand, which has a history that expands 500 years. So the fact that in Europe, <laughs> we have so much history here that uh, um, it's, it's crazy for me to kind of go to these the, these historic places. I collect coins. I'm embarrassed to say, but I have, I have, I collect coins from everywhere I go in historic areas. And I've spent way too much time researching and even like cleaning old coins that have, you know, that, that have built up on them to try and it's like opening a present when you buy an ancient coin, but you don't know what it is. And I clean them. So I don't know. I'm just a history geek. So anything to do with history <laughs> and coins and that's, that's, that's <laughs> seriously cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm in good company because my girlfriend does not <laughs> think so. <laughs> I think it's just like when when we get people on, everyone's got a unique answer. Like I don't think anyone ever has like the same kind of hobby and and unwinding and and all that. So it's it's always really cool to hear. Um, yeah. But but thanks again so much for uh, coming on and talking to us about kind of Git repositories, forensics, and everything. Um, like we said before to all our listeners, um, we'll chuck everything in the show notes. We'll grab some more, uh, show notes off Mackenzie to chuck in as well. Um, uh, including their, their website. So you can go check them out if it's something that you're, you're interested in or, or something that you need. Um, but thanks for listening. Um, 
this will be on YouTube, Forensic Focus. Uh, if you like our stuff, please like and subscribe and chuck down comments if you've liked the content so we can chuck up some more stuff. But thanks again, Mackenzie, and um, hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Yeah, it was awesome, guys. Thanks. I had a great time. I've, I haven't Fantastic. laughed so much on a podcast for a while, so this is <laughs> a good time. Awesome. All right. Excellent. See you, everyone. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you.